All righty. Well, hi. How's it going? I hope you all are having a great day. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time right now. It's probably not going to be a little bit of a time. I'm going to do like a director's commentary. Um, because I'm doing it on a computer, I can do this really... And since I'm also the editor, I can do this really cool thing. Instead of just watching the movie, I can come into my timeline here in Premiere Pro and sort of show you some of the thought process that went behind the creation of Project 182. The first thing I want to show you, not this, is a little robot loading thing because I was gonna, I made this in like Illustrator and After Effects, um, and I never posted it anywhere. So, I don't know. It was sort of kind of like the the thing where it was, um you know, robots and whatnot, and Axel's a robot. And I made that, not really any relation in hindsight, but I'm still proud of that because it's like small little animation like that. If you saw Space Oddity, I'm, I hope you liked it. I did not, in fact, animate that. That was the brilliant artistic abilities of Brian, a great friend of mine. Um, if you haven't seen that, definitely go check that out. Um, I'm gonna, in this video, gonna be going over different stuff that we talked about in the Q&A. If you were there at the official premiere on March 9th of Project 182 at Vrado, um, if you weren't there, you can still watch this and then I'll go over a lot of the stuff that was asked in the questions and answering session of that premiere. And even if you were there, I'm most definitely gonna be going over stuff that you have never seen before uh, or never heard because I'm going to go through the entire movie, and this is... I was going to write down stuff that I wanted to talk about, and then I just never did. But I'm going to be going over different things as I watch the movie that stick out to me. Because every single, like, second of this film had so much thought behind it. And I don't, you know... It just took a really long time behind, like, the writing, the editing. And I don't think upon the first watch, or even there's, like, the behind-the-scenes stuff that no one would ever know about unless they watched a video like this. So if you're interested in the behind-the-scenes of Project 182, definitely watch this. I'm definitely going to be forgetting stuff because I didn't write down stuff um, to talk about, but it's fine. So the first thing, I, I guess we can just go ahead and play it. Initializing test number one. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be like pausing and starting it a ton of times. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, go see the movie. It's on my YouTube. If you're watching this video, that means you found my YouTube channel. So just watch the film first and then come back to this. This is going to be a really long video, I feel like, because I'm literally every single second I'm going to be talking about. Okay, I'm procrastinating here. Um, for the opening, I wanted it to be a cold opening. And in hindsight... Obviously, there's a lot of issues with this movie, but there are a lot of things that work great with this movie. I think the the jump is fine. Initializing test number one. That jump is fine. Here, let me turn up the audio real quick. That jump is fine at the beginning, but I feel like I could add like a five-second slug. Um, and I go through multiple rendering states of this film, and I'll, I'll show you, and I do tiny little tweaks as I go on, but if you come here, you realize that we have five seconds right here, of nothingness. And I render this film multiple times for a few reasons. The main reason is so I can submit it to different like festivals and, and for different purposes and stuff like that. So one of the things that I have changed is extending that beginning period a little bit more so that way people can be like mentally prepared. Because when they hit play, it's like right there, no you know what I mean? So that's something that I totally changed. Um, very first voice that you hear is my friend Gabby. Um, I met Gabby last year through theater, um, and she's been in some of my classes. So, yeah. I reached out to Gabby just because I needed an enthusiastic voice, and she absolutely fits that mold. A lot of my actors I either met or got to see a different side of um, from our fall production that we did at a high school play, because I was actually in that. Um, so Michael and Ezra, I actually met them because of our fall play. And Gabby, for her character in the fall play, it's called Employees Must Wash Their Hands Before Murder. I saw a different side of her because last year I worked with her. 
well, I didn't work directly with her. I was like the props manager or whatever. Um, and she played Humpty Dumpty, like the detective, and then completely different character for this past fall, so fall of 2022, um, of the employees must wash hands. Uh, she plays an extremely exciting character. And after what, like, she is just like full on ex. And like that's the point of her character. It's a comedy, and she plays she played her character to a T. So after watching her perform like that, um, I was like, I'm definitely gonna ask her to be the voice of Iris because I just needed someone who was very excited. You know what I mean? Um, the whole British accent thing was kind of her spin on things. You can ask her. Actually, if you see her around, you can definitely ask her about that. Um, she does have like an obsession with specifically the royal family, but I, I feel like just British people in general. Um, so the British accent was something she she definitely brought to the table that was not written in her script directly, but it works because I feel like a lot of us like virtual assistants are, you know, British. Um, but yeah, also Iris spelled backwards is Siri, which is fun and. I've been told not all that original, apparently. I don't know. Okay. Well, anyways, you see what I mean by this is going to take forever? Okay. Well, let's continue here. Number one. So we're starting up. Error. We're starting up here. Uh, it's kind of loud humming. It's really annoying. And when I watch it in public, it's like I actually do get self-conscious about watching this because like literally everyone uh, around me can hear it uh, anyways um, text here i don't know why this text ec rendered like this like the beginning I don't know, it's such a small minute thing but again it's like the small because i'm spending hours editing this it's like look at the k it's like fuzzy Error. and then as it goes on like the whole thing's fuzzy now it's clear, but before, for a few, like a split Error. second, it's fuzzy. Error. That's just the way that it rendered. I don't really know. This text was an official Nintendo text. It's not, I don't think, it's not the Nintendo text, but it was one of the text, one of the original, I don't even know what it's called here. Let me, let me take a look. It is... corporate the font is called corporate and it's something that nintendo used on the nintendo Enter entertainment system um and since i'm going for like retro robotic technology i chose that font threw it in after effects gave it a little glow i like the green here it's supposed to obviously represent like a terminal for coding or something like that Burr. initializing test number 22 um here's the beginning of this so funny thing about this is i didn't know i'm I, I worked up until this point i had done after effects for about a year not even a year at this point oh no, no just just past a year I'd, I'd been working in after effects but i wasn't constantly working in after effects this is by far the biggest visual effects heavy film that I made even though we only have the beginning sequence and then the science fair sequence that have visual effects in it and then the titles and then the text messages and stuff like that but for this one or for this entire opening sequence the the concept behind it was I created a single frame in Photoshop and on that frame had all of my overlay so it had like this little grid blue and later on this is what the final product looks like. I have the semi-transparent blue grid um, and then all of this other stuff and some Nikes here. I don't know who those belong to. Um, so I started with the final product and then because I was, he's going through the iterations of the robot, I started to essentially like, what's the word? Get rid of stuff at the beginning. So since I knew what I since I knew what my finished product looked like, I could take away a whole bunch of this stuff and then just leave me with like the the this grid thing here and then s start to add a couple things here and there 
as it grows because you start from something that's constant and then you add onto that. It just adds a little, another level of continuity. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and then in After Effects, I was just playing around with different effects until I'm like, yeah, this one kind of works. And that's how it was because I was like, I kind of knew After Effects, but I wasn't super comfortable with it. And I'm like, okay, so then this works. And then that's kind of how I rolled. Action. Uh, here's this. That's me. Initializing test number 93. Um, is this, the blue is kind of like VHS ish i guess and then i posterize this frame rate posterization is essentially the the ability or i guess the posterization is essentially in editing you can chop out frames so it's like if i want this frame frame rate to be i don't know like was like eight eight frames a second it'll chop out everything until there's only eight frames a second and it'll make it really jumpy to and that's on purpose um, there's a whole thing with frame rates. If you're not familiar with frame rates, it's essentially how many pictures the camera takes per second. And this was all filmed in, I believe, 24 frames per second, which is the standard for cinema. Um, but then in post-production, while I was editing this, I on purpose took out frames to make it look really choppy. Um, and that's kind of frame rate for you. And it's essentially multiple pictures put together. This is the overall concept of frame rates. Overall, just pictures consecutively taken over and over again to give the illusion of motion. When in fact, it's just a whole bunch of still images flashing before our eyes 24 frames a second. And that's essentially what, that's why they call it movie magic. Because it's illusions, it's magic. It's like, you know, you watch a movie and you cry. And like, none of that stuff was real but it felt so real. I'm getting really like philosophical here. Uh, in the background, it's so, so minute details, um, but shout out to Rio for really um, making sure that everything looks super cool as far as the production design. She was an incredible production designer. A lot of these parts were my eighth grade science fair project where I worked with like raspberry pies and breadboards. So I had a lot of circuitry and yeah. Anyways, I'm going to continue because I'll probably come back to that table later on. Initializing test number 181. Here's number 181. Hear me? Axel. Face Axel. identification. Looks difficult. That was probably the easiest part of this entire thing because I just got the After Effects to sense where his face was and then it did automatically. This whole squiggle thing I did on purpose. The After Effects masking, whatever, artificial intelligence followed this whole circle thing. It followed his face upwards, but it's like as he's shutting down, it's like, like I said, the minute things. As he's shutting down, his sensor's becoming less aware, and then he passes out again. Wait, I have an idea. He says, wait, I have an idea. In case you're wondering what that idea was, the idea that Nate has is to put the watch on him. Obviously, that watch comes back. We see this expansion because he goes from sort of a two-dimensional figure, and I needed something, you know what I mean? He goes from sort of like this robot, and his view opens up right there. Um, and I have a mask that follows that circular, I don't even know what that's called, um, to see that there's a processing core right here. Um, something that you may have noticed before is during all of the startups, it sounds robotic-y. It sounds all the annoying whirls and noises. Except this last one, if you listen closely, is a heartbeat because he's, you know, human, but like not really, but like kind of is. That wasn't the first choice for the watch. The original watch looked a lot cooler. Um, we didn't have it for day one of shooting, and because of continuity's sake, even though we had it later on, we had to stick with the same watch. You hear me? Axel, you hear me? This was all filmed at Buckeye Union High School, in, in case you were wondering, because we don't have an auto shop. In fact, uh, any person who's aware of welding knows that this stuff back here is used for welding. I couldn't really tell you what it is, but 
This is actually a welding room. Their auto room, which they do have, was very messy and way too loud to us for us to film in. This room was also super duper loud. Um, I think I owe it to our audio people. Um, and then also whatever artificial intelligence Premiere Pro had when I was editing it to get rid of that background hum, background noise, um, to get it usable. I wouldn't say that it's very good, but it's definitely usable. Yes. Um, okay. This lamp back here is sort of supposed to, in addition to being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, anyways, it's supposed to be the lamp from Brian. I mentioned Brian earlier. I worked with him on Space Oddity. He's made some incredible films. One of my favorite films that has ever come out of our high school is called Flicker. It's a short film that Brian made, and it uses these types of lamps. So I specifically sought out this type of lamp to have a sort of an Easter egg. And you had no idea until I just mentioned it right now. Um, hi. Um, Hello. Yep, that's my car in the background. That's why I like telling people I drove my car into a school. Super fun. Um, it's to make it look like an auto shop when, in fact, it's a welding I am welding class at a high school. Calibrating. Calibrating. This is my tie. Watch his costume as we go on. It becomes so it's super formal right now, and that's on purpose because he's a robot. He doesn't know how to dress like an actual human. And it's super formal, and he's it's all one color, and it's all navy. He has navy slacks, navy button down, navy bow tie. Um, as he sort of assimilates into as he assimilates into being like human he starts to develop more casual clothing. Um, this is my uncle's auto shop. Let me turn this up. Auto shop. Uh, yeah, this is where like people come to get their cars fixed and stuff. My dad helped start it. And I was made here. Uh, yeah, uh, this is my space where I could... Okay, sorry, I was uh, adjusting the audio. Um, but if we come back started and i was here. made here uh yeah uh this is my space sorry my dad started uh yeah this that's my dad um if you didn't know that um so that's my dad he brought us some food which you can actually see in the background but you can't really tell that it's a whole bunch of junk on the auto it's it's on a it's in a later scene it's when uh, it's the first scene. It's at like the five minute mark. Yeah, this scene right here. You can see some junk in the background. Uh, I'll get to that later. Shop. Uh, yeah, this is where like people come to get their cars fixed and stuff. My dad helped start it. And I was made here. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is my space where I could work on projects on and off. Tiff Ryan, um, the guy who plays Tommy, also ran audio for the scenes that he wasn't appearing in. We needed a picture from Ezra and his dad. That's his actual literal dad. Um, because it was such a late note. A lot of this stuff was late notice. Um, this is the best that we had to work with. But he sent it to me like the day that we were filming. And I was like, okay. So I order it that morning. And I get like five of these. But I order it that morning from Walgreens. And I show up because I had to, what was it? Oh, I was meeting our locations coordinator, uh, Mr. Bauer, super cool, at a certain time. And I didn't have time to go to Walgreens after our school ended and then drive to Walgreens and then drive to Buckeye and then start filming. I had to show up before anyone else so I could start setting up lights and camera calibrating gimbals and stuff like that. Um... So actually, Ryan picked this up on his way here. Um, so while I was setting this all up, he went to Walgreens, picked up a few copies of these. Um, if you've seen the movie, then you know why, because he rips it and we needed that for a few takes, so. You were in this photograph with other people. There's the watch. Yeah, that's me and my dad. Is he here? Um. Is this up? No, I was about to say, like, there's a reason why it was so quiet. Okay. Hopefully you can hear this better. Maybe. 
He and I had a lot of fun together. There we go. Uh, he was helping me uh, build this for you. Okay. He said uh, he and I were going to go to the park and fight around. Okay. Um, this is a battery pack from my Raspberry Pi project. Some more battery packs. Um, on this to-do list, I don't think I can zoom in. Um, but it says work on drone and it has a few other things. But in big letters, it says get a friend. Rio had a lot of fun making up different things to write on post-it notes and stuff like that. But <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Okay. Fight around. What is my primary purpose? I don't really know, actually. Ever since last year, I've just been looking for a friend. Uh, so I just thought, why not build one? It's easier. I guess your purpose is just help me with homework and school and stuff. What is school? So I'm talking a lot about the production and stuff. Um, I also want to highlight some other parts. Definitely the writing took me a really long time to do. The concept of this film was... Well, originally it was a music video. Because for my class assignment, it was... We need to make a sci-fi-esque film. This one fits more into drama, uh, I'll admit it. Um, but there's definitely very prevalent sci-fi elements to this film. It was supposed to be a three minute, it was like two minutes and 50 second music video was the original concept of that. And then I, pre I present this concept to my teacher and he looks at me and he's like, no, it's supposed to be a film. Albeit he wasn't expecting a 1615 film, um, or I guess 1616 here on um, YouTube because they had an extra second. Um, but he was like, it's not it's not supposed to be a music video. It's supposed to be like an actual short film. And I'm like, okay, well, then I stretch it all out. And the way that I, my mind works is it's like it's, I don't even, I can't even explain it. It's like I'm constantly trying to add stuff. So it could be five minutes, but then I have an idea for this, and I have an idea for this, and then I have an idea for that. And then it just gets longer and longer. And then if you've seen the film, it's still even fast paced for 1615. Like, honestly, if you added a, a few more elements into this film, then those new elements could definitely stretch this out to nearly like a feature length film, like a short feature length film. Um, and that's sort of how it was with the writing process and then also the production process. So it was like I had this idea, I had that idea, and then I just kept adding more and more into it. Um, like for the casting, it's like who can I get for this? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to cast teachers in certain scenes. And then after that, I'm like, oh, you know what would be really cool? Instead of casting teachers as adults, what if I actually casted our school principal? Because that would be super cool. And then it just gets more convoluted and complicated. Uh, just because, I don't know, because I wanted to challenge myself. I don't know. It's, I, I get creative and I, I have ideas and then it's, I try to make them work. And then sometimes it was very stressful for me, definitely very stressful for my cast and crew. So I'm very, very appreciative. If you see you shoot shadow side is a tip that I learned. Um, I spent a lot of money on these lights because we didn't have particularly very good lights for what I needed them for. Um, we had a lot of tungsten lights, and these ones are bicolor, which means I can change the color temperature of them. I can make them really warm, or I can make them really cool. So I can make them really yellow or really blue. Um, I don't know if there's any scenes where I have them really yellow, but if you watch the night scenes, I make them a lot bluer to sort of symbolize the moonlight. We're going to use the cover that you're my cousin from Bosnia. Okay. And uh, let me go back for a second. We're going to use the... Okay. This is his next outfit. This outfit is sort of less formal, still extremely formal, but we're sticking with the Navy idea, okay? Cover that you're my cousin um, from Bosnia. Here's something so ironic. Tarek does the music for Project 182. What I didn't, I made up some random... Com well, I didn't make up a random country. I looked up a random country... Um, I'm like, this is where you're going to be from, like for our cover story. And I'm like, I just included some random country into the script. But the composer for Project 182 
it's actually Bosnian, which is crazy. And he asked me, and he's like, did you know? And I was like, I had no clue. So that's a little fun fact. And that you're staying with me for a couple months. Okay, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else I wanted to add. Back there is Ray. She helped us with... Um, well, she's the assistant director, um, and we filmed this after school, so it's supposed to be a cafeteria full. I definitely don't think I got that effect, but that was the effect I was going for. I found some online sounds to make it sound like a bustling cafeteria. If you look too hard, you'll see that all these chairs are empty. So she's talking to nobody, but it looks like she's talking First to thing you want to know about high school people. is you just want to blend in. That means keeping your head down and just not looking at anything. It's so funny. I'm sorry. First thing you want to know about high school is you just want to blend in. That means keeping your head down and just not looking at anybody. <laughs> so funny. That's Rio, um, production designer. Incredible. Um, I have cameos from almost all of C crew, uh, except for Andrew, unfortunately. Don't eat the school lunch here. Just bring something from home. Oil. That's a funny gag. I'll come back to that. Um... That oil can is actually a paint can that came from Mr. DeMarco's classroom. So thanks for that. And then we just printed out the OIL on like a cricket, I believe. Um, this is a Mandalorian lunchbox that I have. I don't know why. Um, the shirt that he's wearing is one of the shirts that Peter Parker Spider-Man wears. If you watch this movie, he wears a lot of Spider-Man's shirts. We didn't go out there and buy them. Ezra's like a huge fan of Tom Holland's Spider-Man. I think of all the Spider-Mans, actually. Um, so he just happened to have these in his closet. So that's super funny. Um, most of the shirts that Michael wears are mine. The original um, bow tie that he wears uh, is my bow tie. I don't know what happened to it, actually. This is the last time I ever saw it. Okay. Uh, don't get the candy from... The kid in the I don't want to keep pointing out, but like the lunch lines close, the innovation lounge lights are off. There's no one here except for the cleaning people. The cleaning people, thank you so much for allowing us to film there. They hated that we filmed there um, because they were trying to clean. And we decided to do it off to the side and try to um, help them out in any way possible. Um, this sort of area um, isn't perfect. But this is, I chose this general area because this is where the eggs, bacon, grits, sausage video was filmed. So if you remember that vine, it was a vine, I believe. Um, this is the original video of the kid rapping that is actually at my school and in this general area of the cafeteria. Okay. And then you can hear in the background um, what's supposed to be people in a cafeteria. Okay. Uh, don't get the candy from the kid in the back. It's just, it's not actually candy. And don't get caught up in the wrong crowd because you don't want people getting the wrong idea. And do not, do not at all talk to the football guys. They're gonna eat you alive. Sorry, I did not intend to have a collision with you. Ryan wanted to be in my film really bad. And I was like, you know what, I'll do it. Um, going to Tommy's character, fun fact, um, Tommy is named after Major Tom from Space Oddity. Um, he's 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 not necessarily the jock type, just by looking at him. I will also say that Ryan is probably one of the best swimmers in the entire state. Um, he's gotten a state title and a lot of other accolades throughout his years of swimming. Um, and I think he's going to be continuing on swimming in college. Um, so he's really, like, really good at swimming. Um, but apart from that, I think the concept of Tommy was really interesting because I didn't necessarily want a run-of-the-mill high school bully. I wanted something more than that. Okay, and that's why he's wearing glasses, and that's why he doesn't look like a typical football jock. Um, people are like, well, he doesn't really look like a football player. Um, okay, I'll take that criticism. Except Tommy's character is, like, sophisticated. Okay. Um, and I'll get more on that later because he has a lot more 
experiences in the film. Here they are throwing the football. Fun fact about this scene, Mr. Bot, the engineering teacher, was in the film classroom talking to my film teacher. Um, and while they were doing that, I asked Mr. Bot if I could film in his classroom. And he said yes. Wait for it. I didn't tell him what we were filming. He had no idea that we had a football. We were, listen to me, don't do this. I telling you to be very transparent with your location coordinators what you're planning on doing however there was a small chance of him saying yes i wanted to be known that we were very careful and we were nowhere close to breaking any of these computers whatsoever we caught every single football that was thrown between the two of them and it was hardly any at all like they stopped it wasn't like they were throwing in between takes like they were throwing only for what needed to be filmed. In fact, in this scene of the reflection, the original take of it was they weren't throwing the football and I was like, oh, actually I can see Michael in the reflection there. So let's make sure that we're still throwing the football. But we were super careful there. So sorry, Mr. Bot, I apologize. Miss Waddle came around the corner there. School was in Okay, um, we have this thing called the Ewing Ghost. And right here, if you School look at was. this corner, the light turns off all by itself. It might be a sensor, but I like to think that it's the Ewing Ghost. Insightful. And there it goes. I noticed. You were incorrect on your analysis of the football team. They did not eat me alive. Perhaps it is because I am not alive. Uh, I get it. Just make sure you don't talk to them again. Oh, hey, Axel. Hey, Tommy. There were some scenes when I was writing that were so fun to write. This hallway scene was so fun to write. His 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 little, they did not eat me alive. Perhaps it's because I'm not alive. Oh, it's genius. Okay, and then right here in this same scene is probably, I would say the funniest part of the whole film. Oh, are you Axel's friend? Um, Actually his cousin. We have a couple classes. Ugh, I love this scene so much. It's so funny because it's like, What's not said? Okay, wait, ready? Together, Spanish, history, and P. Oh. <laughs> Directing was so fun. It was so fun because I, I had to tell Ryan because... <laughs> and he did so good at this. He has no idea who Nate is. And it was so funny to explain to Ryan. I was like, he is going to be telling you. He's like, we have all these classes together and you're supposed to not recognize him at all don't notice that this is the same engineering scene we only walked around the same hallway over and over again filming different scenes don't don't take a look at that but it was so funny oh my god because like it wait oh I actually you actually friend it. um actually his cousin we have a couple classes together spanish history and p oh my goodness it's oh, okay. so funny well, anyways uh, at my house on friday at nine we're all getting together if you want to come axel interesting i was never invited to anything in bosnia Please wait a minute while I check my schedule. This is the original, oh. Yes, I'm available. All right, I'll see you there, man. That's the original dial-up internet modem thing. A lot of adults recognize that, but oh my goodness, it's so funny. And I was trying to explain to them, I was like, just pause, just pause, just stop talking, look off into space, Michael. Ryan, don't say anything, just look at him very awkwardly. And in the moment, how do I explain it? To, how do I explain this scene to them? I tried explaining it to them, but it was so, it's such a weird concept for them to under, like, like just in general for people to understand, like, what do you mean? Like there's random sound effects in the background. And I have the outtakes where I'm like, it doesn't matter. Keep looking until I cue you. Keep staring off into space because he would always turn back too soon. And I'm like, no, you, you, you have to understand. It's like, it's supposed to be awkward. This is only yes. the, this is only the second most awkward part of the whole film. I'm available. All right, I'll see you there, man. What did I just tell you? Okay. Miss Summers, let's talk about this scene. This scene was really interesting to film because some scenes I was able to throw together last second. It's one of the things I regret about this film is sometimes 
the same day that I'm organizing something is the same day that we are filming. In hindsight, and this is the number one feedback from my casting crew that I got for the film, is that I need to have a very planned out schedule before even day one of filming. But some scenes I had to f- prepare for weeks in advance. This is one of them because of the extras, because of the extras that I had um, for this film. So because of this, I reached out to the theater club and we had to film this on a Tuesday because the theater club, was they meet on Tuesdays after school. And I planned with a teacher and it, I was going to be like, all right, you're going to come in after school at this time. We're filming here um, in, in this science class. And the day of filming comes. She was there on Monday. Then I show up to school on Tuesday and I go to my class on Tuesday and we have a substitute teacher. And I'm like, what the heck? Because this is my math teacher that she's supposed to be in the film. But then I go to my math class during school and I'm like, why is there a sub in here? We're filming after school. And it turns out she got, of all days to get sick, she got sick on this day. Um, So I was like, oh my goodness, because what else are we supposed to do? I would have to set this scene back another week and I don't think I can do that because I'm trying to put this all, finish this all right before spring break. Um, Or not spring break, winter break, my bad. I'm trying to film this all like three weeks before winter break. And I'm like, I don't think that we could reschedule. So we ran up and down the hallways asking every single teacher that I saw if they would like to be the science teacher for this scene. Um... All right, next month is our annual... Miss Summers, I'm so thankful for Miss Summers um, because she was so willing to do it. And Well, initially she was like, well, I don't know about that. I have to go home. Um, but she did so good. And she kept apologizing for all of her lines that she messed up. But I think she did an incredible job, especially for literally asking her, can you come with us right now to go film in front of a classroom full of students she's used to teaching in front of a classroom full of students but to just have like a whole bunch of people filming we had like a lav mic below her we had a boom mic above her we had light uh you can't really see it but maybe in the reflection like like we had like light fixtures set up um and she totally did it And this randomness on the whiteboard, again, is something that Rio worked on because Rio is just the the finite details were so perfectly executed. Um, And I tried to film people. This was interesting. We were having like a Christmas spirit week. Um, So this is supposed to be a festive outfit, but I think it passes for just like a normal outfit. And then for my extras, I tried to film any extras that weren't in sort of the spirit week. So every single person in this scene you see is just a normal close. All right, next month is our annual science fair. Um, There's like a whole timeline. Like I have events happening in certain months on certain days. And that was to ensure continuity. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, if that makes sense. Um, And... Essentially, there was supposed to be a calendar during one of the montages of him working on the drone. And it's like, you see the calendar flying by. Um, That never made it into the final cut. And so essentially, I have this entire calendar and the entire plot of the movie takes over specific is over a specific amount of months and as the audience you never see that but it really helped with us with keeping the continuity straight it is not optional no matter what mr hernandez says that's mr hernandez i was just trying to find a random person and i'm just now noticing burger king in the background right there i'd never noticed that before not when i was filming not when i was watching it multiple times over uh that is crazy also, if you could stop talking, that'd be great. It can be on any topic um, that is science and engineering. Am I going to talk about this scene right here? Let me talk about this scene right now. Another issue that we ran into the, for the scene is Michael said that he wasn't able to film. And I said, okay, I'm going to try to film this scene and make it seem like they're there, but then... Because he said he wasn't available that day. And make it seem like they're filming 
or like Michael was there, or sorry, Axel was in the classroom when in fact he wasn't. And I do this trick a few other times in the movie where certain people see, because of, like I said, with the illusions and it's sleight of hand, well, sleight of video to make it seem like certain things are real when in fact they're not real. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to have to do that because again, I'm organizing multiple people coming to this classroom after school to film. Um, and then he shows up while I'm setting up the classroom. And I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, I, I guess I can film today. And I'm like, oh, what? That's okay. That took me for a shock. I was a little bit angry because I'm like, what? Uh, we also have Tommy in the background here. But anyways, uh, I'm like, I didn't think we were filming. I didn't think, I f didn't think that I was filming with you today because... You said you weren't going to be available. So we have Ezra's costume. We have Tommy's costume. And we don't have anything for Axel. Because I wasn't planning on filming with him today. Oh. Hello. Oh, okay. There we go. My microphone was being weird. Um. And then someone points at me. And they say, or actually it was Sarah, our costume uh, designer. And she points at me. And she says, you're wearing a navy shirt. And I look down and I'm like, well, what do you know? I'm wearing a navy shirt. So I ended up, what did I end up doing? I gave him my shirt. And then I ended up wearing something. I, I don't know what I ended up wearing. Either either his shirt or, or something. I don't know. Um, or it may have just been my sweatshirt and then nothing underneath. But that's what we ended up doing. And it was a perfect coincidence that this costume continues on with the continuity. Like I was saying, with the Navy outfit and it becomes less formal as the film goes on. Like it was perfect coincidence that that happened. And I was like, what do you know? That's incredible. So, Yeah. Every single scene it was chaotic. Although it looks really cool, super chaotic. Believe me, high levels of stress, especially with the auto shop scenes. I want to talk about those uh, at some point, but I don't know when. Engineering related, and it's one third of your grade for the semester, so it's pretty important. You can start brainstorming now. And he has nothing in his mouth, but I was like, can you chew as if you're chewing gum or something like that? Um, in the I'll say it right now. In the original scene, right here, he says... Bring something from home. Here, listen to him real quick. Okay. Uh, don't get the candy from the kid in the back. It's just, it's not actually candy. Don't take candy from the kid in the back. If we come to this, who is sitting in the back of the classroom? That would be Tommy. You, you see what you, you see what's happening there all right uh, and then also you can't even see him because michael's head is in the way but trevor um who was the assistant camera operator um who helped with some of the scenes was also here and it's one third of your grade for the semester so it's pretty important and trevor does also make his cameo back in the science fair scene you probably know who i'm talking about once i'll show you you can start brainstorming now and then we will uh and to also take care of Sorry. that Okay, so go crazy. Okay, in the background, this little red thing was my uh, jacket, and then we had like a water bottle, and then I don't know what that other bright thing is back there, but. What are you planning on doing for the science and engineering fair? I think it's finally giving me a good excuse. And all the, well, this music right here, there's some parts where I had to include because it was last minute and I didn't give Tarek enough Leeway, and that's on me because again, all of this was super rushed production. Um, some of the stuff I had to find royalty free on YouTube, but a lot of this music, including this scene, was all composed and created by a high school senior, which is incredible. Um, and I want to talk more about that. Probably not today. I want to probably be in like a call with him so that way the both of us are kind of talking about how the creation of the music came to be. But it's just, I love it so much. It's like one one of my top favorite things about this entire film is the score. So working on the drone. Here's another Peter Parker shirt. And now you can help me. That is a good idea. When do you want to start? I'll see you tomorrow. 
I'm sorry, Nate, but I'm not available tomorrow because uh -oh. I'm spending time with Tommy. What? I thought we were gonna work on the project. I would. However, my schedule is already booked and my programming prevents the circumvention of events. Circumvention. That's super funny because I spent a long time on that script and I completely forgot that I included the word circumvention. If you look it up, this is what circumvention means. I gotta look it up because I don't even know. Circumvention is the action is the action of overcoming a problem or difficulty, typically in a clever or surreptitious way. So it's essentially overcoming a problem or difficulty, um, and some cinnamons, cinnamons, some synonyms for circumvention on thesaurus.com is avoidance bypass dodging eluding evasion and null so it sort of fits his like the circumvention of his programming i forgot that i included that word and then we did our table read at the buckeye library um all of us all cast and crew suit all together that was so much fun and i don't have any pictures or video from that i only have pictures from borrows um that night uh, after we did the table read but i forgot that i wrote circumvention so when we're doing our table read at buckeye library he says circumvention i was like whoa big word alert i didn't even know that i included that uh, I'll, I'll have to fix that and he I, well you know how it goes okay first night scene are you ready axel what are we doing the background of this scene specifically is so colorful. Like you see you colorful lights and look, look, look at all these different colors, like red and pink and all this. These are Christmas lights. It adds really cool variety to the otherwise black shot because if these weren't in the background, it would be completely black and you would just have the little bit of lighting that I had on the SL60 or no, no, no it was the ML60. One of the lights that I had. Um, and then you wouldn't have anything else. So I'm super glad that it was Christmas time and we got a lot of different people's Christmas lights in the hey, background. Hey, in Bosnia. Well, it's really simple. All you do is throw the toilet paper at the tree. The original... Oh, sorry. Let me, let me, toilet paper let me the play tree. this for comedic effect real quick. Peeing in Bosnia. Well, it's really simple. All you do is throw the toilet paper at the tree. Okay, the original concept of the scene is like it was supposed to be serious. Um, he's getting in a lot of trouble and he's TPing. Um, but this goes along the fact of like Tommy's not like a typical bully. And this whole thing isn't just portrayed as a whole bunch of hooligans. Like I, it is, it is. Don't get me wrong. But it's like, it's funny. And it wasn't supposed to be funny until after watching this. And you can talk to them. This is one of their least favorite scenes because it was super cold out. Um... Probably not from where some people are from, because in Arizona, in December, it might not sound horrible, but when that sun goes down, it does get cold. Uh, and it was super cold when we filmed this scene. Um, and we had to TP that tree over and over again, because... What are we doing? Put the paper at the tree. This thing where it bounces off the tree, that happened multiple times, until I was like, okay... Um, we're gonna get a we'll run the camera over and over and over again until we get the right shot And then we got the right shot and I rewatched it and I was like this is This is trash. Well, I guess it's literally trash um, So I was like I'm gonna play this for comedic effect then and then we had a whole TPing scene that I cut because less is more and Everyone just stares in disbelief. <laughs> I love how Ryan's mouth is just open. He's like bro uh, we got Mischievous Kid 2, my friend Griffin, who actually lived across the street from where we were filming this. So does Michael, um, and then Chris as well, and then obviously Ryan. All this, all this is, again, original music, which is really cool. This drone I got from Mr. Bot, the engineering teacher, it doesn't fly so at the last scene i do the little switcheroo with the actual drone that flies and films one of the questions that was brought up to me is okay explain me this this is someone else talking but it was like how can 
Nate create a perfect humanoid robot that will pass as human to anyone who's looking at him, and he has no imperfections whatsoever. And then he makes a drum that looks like trash. No, not trash. No, no offense to the engineering kids. It actually, when I got it from Mr. Bont, it actually was really cool with all the wires and stuff. Um, but the question still remained, why does a 3D printed plastic drone be the same thing that a kid who creates a full-on humanoid robot? How is that? How does that equivalate? And what I say to those people is, you're reading way too much into a fictional film. I'm just kidding. No, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Okay, this, um, what do we call this? See, I've been out of school for a couple weeks and I already forget, forget. This um, rack focus, thank you. This rack focus here symbolizes Axel's computer and how he's not there. You see his computer right here and then we do a little rack focus to Nate who's all by himself. Okay. This scene is so much fun. This was a pickup shot that we did, so technically this was the last sh scene that we ever filmed um, because I did a pickup shot after we had already finished filming. Um, here, also going back to the costumes thing, it was just incredible the way that I was able to work with Sarah to sort of see how this to sort of see this all work through, he's starting to zip up the Navy because the Navy is sort of his attachment to Nate and we're starting to see it disappear. And he's in full on normal clothes now, but um, these people in the background had no idea what was going on, by the way. I just started filming at the beginning of school. Uh, I got this Mountain Dew Zero Sugar out of the vending machine. He probably would have wanted like a Pepsi or something like that. The reason I didn't do Pepsi is because it looks way too similar to oil and it might be um, confused as oil. And you may be wondering, well, what do you mean it might be confused as oil? This is supposed to be a very obviously soda because earlier in the film, he drinks oil. And you might be like, this is a continuity error before he's a robot and he's Actually, like, candy. Oh, talk to the full. He's supposed to be drinking oil if he's a robot. It's a continuity error if he's... Hold on. It's got to be a continuity error if he's drinking soda now. Um, it's Again, it all reflects his assimilation, assimilation into becoming a human. So now he can drink human drinks now, um, which I feel like was super... A lot cooler in my mind when I was writing it. Um, but it's just one of the tiniest little details of him becoming human. I'm gonna do that's my brother right there. Well, all these people are my friends, but I just wanna point on my brother real quick. He's also in the science for a scene. Okay, um, this whole thing I made in Photoshop um, this background sort of a thing was a screenshot that I had from my Raspberry Pi. This is one of the um, terminals if you're coding in Python on a Raspberry Pi. And I can't believe I forgot the name of it already. It is... I forgot the name of it. But it's just... When you're coding in Python, this is one of the things. And look at these like small little details. Because I'm editing this whole thing in... Um, Photoshop, I can add different things like, look, it says Axel 182.0.2, not installed down here. Um, up here, this Google stuff that you see up here was actually my original code for my eighth grade science fair project that I just copy and pasted in here. This specifically right here is a speech to text extension that Google made for Python, um, which I used because uh, it was open source. So that's just what this, if you're wondering what this code is, it's it's essentially converting speech to text is this Python code. I just need a random function code stuff and it was Google speech to text. So that's what that is. This was the first night scene that I filmed with my expensive um, lighting equipment. Right here is Hank the dog. That's Michael's dog. This 
whole place is Michael's house. Come on, guys. Um, the story behind this was where were we? It may have been the play, actually, or it may have been a choir concert. I think no, it was a choir concert um, where Michael was there, and so was Michael's mom, and I was there, and I was filming because I film almost every single event that our school does. Um, but I saw I, Michael's mom there, and I had been looking around for anyone to egg their house. I would egg my house, um, but if anyone watching this knows, I live probably 30 minutes away from any of these actors because I'm on a variance for high school, um, so all of my actors and crew live 30 minutes away from me. And actually, it took a lot of effort and a lot of stress to get to Buckeye High School which is actually only halfway to my house. Um, so I just would imagine how much of a struggle it would have been to actually, you know, come all the way to my house. So I were asking people, and of course they're going to say no if I want to egg their house. They're not horrible people for saying that. They're comp, well, they're, they're sane people. Um, but luckily for me, there was a, just the tiniest bit of insanity, not insanity, wonder that Michael's mom had um, cause originally I asked her and I was like, can we fit, please film an egging scene at your house? And she was like, no, of course not. Of course, who's going to say that in the right mind? Um, but then after some convincing, I looked at her and I was like, it's for art. This is for art. I, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I said something like that. I remember it was a really awkward interaction. I'm pretty sure I said verbatim. This is for art. I definitely, I said that to her. That is like a words that came out of my mouth verbatim. And then she's like, okay, fine. And, and I was like, it's just going to be one egg. The rest of the eggs are going to be hard boiled. We're going to be throwing it at your house, but only one of them is going to break because all of them are hard boiled. And I was trembling when I was marking the hard boiled eggs. And I was like, I'm hoping none of the, like I did hard boil them. And I was just hoping that none of them were accidentally for whatever reason, with the yolk still runny, except for one of them. Um, this is really fun. As my first ever night scene, a lot of this stuff was first evers for me. Because we were coming out of the pandemic, I wasn't able to help any upperclassmen with their films, which is why I involved a lot of crew who are underclassmen. Um, almost the entirety of our, majority of our crew were like jun freshmen through juniors and so was our a lot of our cast like michael and ezra are both sophomores as a matter of fact um and anyways i wanted to give people the experience of working on a film because there's a lot of mistakes with this film that i hope aren't reciprocated in future films because of that experience tommy do you ever question if what we we're doing is right who ever said anything about right well don't you think someone could get hurt by this Axel, you gotta relax, man. So, lucky thing of how Michael's neighborhood is ordered, it might look like they're in the street and that's on purpose, um, but all of these houses are surrounded by a grass, like, courtyard area outside, so we didn't have to film in the street, hey, nobody but it ever still got hurt from a looks like a street. Like, these look like the houses across the street, but actually down here, what they're standing on is, like, a grass field, and you have to, like, park a road, like, an entire road, or an entire block the other way if you want to get into this area. Like, their their garages are on the back side of their homes, which is very odd, um, but it was super helpful when we were filming. There's the egg. He throws the egg. No! Oh, oh no. Nice one, There's Chris. That was an ad lib. Um... I'm going to riff on Chris a little bit. He likes to, he definitely has a lot of energy. And I knew that he really, really wanted to be in this film. Um, so he interjected an ad lib so he can have a line of this film. This side, you can obviously the very see the very bright light that lights them all up. Um, but I have a very small light on this side that's very warm. Um, and that's sort of to add some continuity later on when they run away and he's underneath the street post. Um, but shout out to Andrew. I lost, well, I didn't lost, lose. I left behind one of the light stands that I thought I brought with us. So Andrew got on a ladder with the ML60 and held it up 
super high um, for a very long time, and his arms were super tired. But thank you so much to Andrew, our head uh, grip, for everything that he was, all the effort that he put into this film. Tommy. Watch his face. Watch his face real quick. Tommy. Yeah? Another. Oh. Okay. Um, this was completely ad lib. The another thing was completely ad libbed. And it's. it's what would this film be without that ad libbed line? Because he was like, should I ask for another? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So Michael had this idea of just ask. And it's so simple. He asks for another egg. But it's like he's no longer giving into peer pressure. He's making his own decisions. And watch his character as it starts off. He's at the beginning. He only in, he only takes in information. And then later on, he starts to question the information that he's receiving. It's like. They did not eat me alive. You that was incorrect. But then he continues to question it until finally he's no longer just questioning um the information that he's being told, but he's actually creating his own information, his own thoughts now. Um so it's sort of this turning point of him becoming his own character. And I just thought that was so incredible. Tommy. And the way that his face lights up is so just like What's the word I'm looking for? Maniacal. I don't even know. It's like he does an incredible job. And it's like you see his face go from robotic at the beginning. And this is the shift where you see and he all of a sudden understands. And it's at this point, you can see it in his face. This line right here. If you if there was any question to where he switches from robot to human, it happens so slowly. So you can't even tell. Um, but if you go back to just seeing what his face looked like how robotic his face looked like at the beginning how robotic it looks right here and then right there right there it switches Tommy. it switch oh my goodness it's so good i'm sorry yeah another oh. this was a um day to night Tommy. effect that i had i yeah. another oh. when originally filming this i did have him turning on the light but it didn't have the effect that i wanted um, so I ended up using this shot right here where the light was on and I added some effects to it. Actually, I said I was going to be coming back to here. So let me see if I can find it. Where, where are we at? We're like later on in the film here. Oh, spoiler. What did I do here? Oh, here they are. So these are my keyframes right here of it looking like a light being turned on. Um, and then I also added, yeah, I added a light right here. Um, so this is a virtual light that I added in afterwards that sort of has the keyframe. So it makes it look like a light being turned on, but it's actually all just the exact same. And I do different keyframes. Keyframes are essentially start and stop points for different effects that I can add. Um, and there's just a limitless amount of effects that I can add. This is like the color temperature. So how, again, going back to how cool or warm I want it. This is the tint. So what the tint looks like. I didn't end up changing the tint or the saturation, um, but the exposure, so how blown out the picture looks, the contrast is like how different the, the all the colors are, and then the highlights and shadows and whites and blacks and all that stuff. All this stuff I keyframe to make it look like a light being turned on. In addition to activating virtual uh, lights here, and I added those right here with an opacity effect. Um, to make it look like there was light coming down from above. Because I feel like if I click on it, it'll show me. Maybe not. I feel like it should show me where the light is. Okay, I 
I guess not. Oh, there we go. There's the light. Um, so I'll put it back to where it was. Um, but that's sort of kind of what it looks like for me. Um, so that's how I did that Scram. effect. Oh, God. That scram was Griffin. I cut it. I, I cut it because it's essentially, it was supposed to be the police showing up. Um, but I just cut it to scram because it makes more sense. That he just called the police, so there's no way they could show up already. And also, I didn't have any police lights. Yeah, another. Oh, ho. Scram. Oh, God. So, there's that. You jerks. The cops are on their way. He's looking out of his... Okay. Cool thing about... Not cool thing. I broke the 180 rule. If you don't know what the 180 degree rule is, it's a thing in film where something seems off. So in the 180 rule, you have to make sure that you're filming this, the camera on the same side of both the actors if they're looking at each other. Um, it's a long-winded explanation to try to explain exactly what it looks like. But essentially, I had it where Ezra was looking off to the right, and I had the camera on the other side, on the flip side, and I had uh, Michael looking back at Ezra. But since I was on the other side of Michael, he was looking to the right. So although they, in real life, they were looking at each other, it looked weird because both characters were looking at the right, but now you can see him looking at the right, and now him looking at the left, and they're sort of kind of like making eye contact. You may be wondering, how did I fix this? This was all made in a very dark studio. I reshot this scene because I broke the 180 rule. I tried flipping him, um, just like flipping the video, but it looked really weird. So I ended up refilming. I think it looks a lot better. And then this is the next scene. Again, you can see with his outfit, he's completely gone from the Navy, gone from the formalities. He's, this is his full-on humanoid outfit. Nate. Just uh, stop talking. I didn't know it was your house. It doesn't matter whose house it was. You see what you've been doing with Tommy? Well, Tommy said that no. Um, their microphone channels are coming in through left and right. Before they were stereo, now they're kind of stereo just because the other ones are picking it up. Um, but if you're wearing headphones, you can hear it a lot better. It's to symbolize their isolation from each other. Um, so since Ezra's on the left side of the scene, he's coming in through the left ear if you're wearing headphones. And since Michael's on the right side, he's coming on the right side. And this scene sort of symbolizes how they're separate from each other. So that's sort of how you can use Nobody. audio to tell a story. Get hurt. You're just gonna go with everything that Tommy says. What about what I say? Well, he's more popular, so I just, so you just assume. assume. Okay, I'm gonna be completely transparent with this film right or with this scene right now. Um, this was crunch time. This was one of the last days. This is the second to last full scene that we filmed, and I was like, I don't know if I can do it. I look at Michael and Ezra, and they're like, We can film it, and I'm so glad we filmed this scene. This is. Story-wise, probably one of my favorite scenes because it's so impactful, um, honestly. Um, and it's so, like, the tension's real. And when he, Michael delivers the one-liners, there's so many great one-liners in this film, but when he delivers it, it's just boom. And every and I watched this live when we did the, the, um, the premiere on March 9th, and the audience was like, no! Like, it was an actual raw reaction. Um, so I really like how that turned, how this whole scene turned out. Um, little known fact, Michael and Ezra were going for the same part in the musical. I'm sort of exposing them a little bit here. Um, they were going for the same part for the musical, and they found out on this day who got what part. And obviously, you can't both get the same part. Um, so I like to imagine like there was some actual, I'm kind of joking, but kind of joking. I don't know. I'm, I'm joking, but there, I, I like to imagine that there was real tension that they like real tension between the two of them that they drew from on this day to film this scene. And it's kind of funny. I thought you just assumed they had the better idea. You know what? I think you're jealous. He's making his own ideas now. That's his very first. I think. That's the very first time he ever said, I think, I believe. 
better idea. Um, oh, wait, let me, wait, wait, wait. like I said, there's going to be stuff that I forget. So him becoming human, um, just real quick. I'm going back. This is unrelated. But okay, so go crazy. Watch this. What are you planning on doing for the Watch science Michael. engineering fair? Watch Michael very uh, I closely. I think it's finally giving me a good excuse. Right there. Th right there at the 4 minute and 55 second mark is the very first time he ever blinks in the film. Because he's a robot, he doesn't blink. And then as the film continues, he blinks normal. But this is the very first time that he ever blinks. I think you can control me, but okay. you want it to be my friend. And not I think you're jealous. Sorry, what? that was unrelated. You're jealous that and we still got Ray in the background to talking to nobody. I find jealous. that kind of funny. You're crazy. I finally have some friends that I actually enjoy hanging out with, and you just can't handle it. You think you can control me and which friends I make? I've seen the little updates you install in my head. I don't know what you're talking about. You think you can dictate which friends I make with just a few ones and zeros? But you never actually cared about what I wanted. You don't know what you want. You're just the robot that I created. The rising mu music is so good. Um, I can't even talk about how incredible this original score is. Because I just wanted a friend. And the sad part is, not even I want to be your friend. Boom! Wow! That's crazy. Okay. I don't know what to say about it. He doesn't want to be his friend. Um, oh, actually, there is something I could talk about this. I tried to make it so Nate was more controlling of Axel. Um, I went through so many iterations of this script. Nate actually had like three names in total. The very first one was Reginald. We went to some weird places because I, again, I had to go from a music video to a full on short film. So there was a lot of changes that need to be made. I got to the scene when I was writing the scene and I was like, Axel's just been mean to Nate for no reason. And I wanted there to be actual conflict where they're both in the wrong. Um, and that's sort of what I encapsulated with Nate trying to be an overbearing and controlling friend. Because originally, in the original script, Nate, at the time his name was Carl, Carl had done nothing wrong. Um, so I felt, but I was like, I want them both to be in the wrong. So what I decided to go with was Nate just being an overbearing friend, being way too controlling of Axel. Um, and that's sort of how I solved that problem. Okay, again with the red jacket in the background, you can, that's uh, Little Caesar's pizza boxes. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this is supposed to be a serious scene, okay. No, not the picture. No! 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 Okay, I'm not a fan of the Star Wars wipe. I'm going to be completely honest. My film teacher asked for the Star Wars wipe. I think it's good. Um, the original intention of this scene, of the ripping up... Okay, hold on. The original intention of the ripping up scene was supposed to be in like the hallway of the school. And then I was like, why not just film it at the at the um, auto shop? Because it's, it's easier since we're already here. And then in editing, I realized why. Because I needed to be in a different setting to make it seem like a different time period. But because he's wearing the same outfit and is in the exact same seat, um, it might be confusing how Axel just appears. And it might seem like it's at the exact same time. When in fact, this is supposed to show time change. Um, so... Of course, the Star Wars wipe is a great way to show that. In general, a fade is a great way to show a changing of time. So what I ended up doing, I told you I'd make many different renderings um, of the film. So I did something very similar, but not a Star Wars wipe, just because I feel like a Star Wars wipe is too similar to, too, too close to Star Wars, and it's sort of cheesy for the moment. I changed it to a fade, um, very nuanced because I just spent so much time editing this. I added a little um, mask around his face. You may be wondering, why did I do that? Because just for a split second, his face, just for a split second, his head is in frame for longer than the rest of the frame. Um, and sometimes that's how transitions are made. I think it just makes it a little bit more 
interesting than just a stagnant fade of the entire screen. His computer, I want to point this out real quick. You didn't notice, you probably didn't notice it originally. Also, this is the original stand where he was created was this little um, dolly here. Uh, we went through a lot of effort to set up this dolly here only for, oh, my, my microphone's scratchy again. Give me a minute. We went through a lot of effort, there we go, to get this dolly here and you and you can't even see it in the final product. I thought you could and then voila, you can't. He's playing the dino game over here and his computer's completely off. So that's a fun little fact. You hear the ding? Um, some of the mixing of, these, of this audio isn't the best, I'm gonna be completely honest. But this one actually wasn't even this one was a ding I added in in post production, and then I gave it different effects here, like is it like a reverb and a whatever limit. I don't know. If, I don't even know what I did to it um, to make it seem like it's actually in the room. Did you finish the science fair thing? No. I was running short on time, so ignore how the bubbles are kind of weird. See, now that I point that out, you're never going to be able to unsee it. Uh-oh. Let me tell you about this scene real quick. I did a cool lighting effect. So again, my trusty ML60 that I keep talking about. Um, I There's like a TV setting that I can set on it to make it look like they're looking at a TV. Um, the thing with this scene is that this auto shop has a ton of what's like emergency lights. So even if you turn off the lights, it's still very bright in there because a lot of lights are still on because they're quote unquote emergency lights. So what I did is I turned down the brightness, it's called the ISO, on the camera to make it super duper dark. Um, but then the problem was you couldn't see the actor's face anymore, faces anymore because everything was super dark. So with the ML60, I made that super duper bright. This light I made super bright. So it was blinding for, <laughs> I'm sorry, Michael and Ryan, but it was blinding for them when they were looking at this because I needed it to look like the lights were off and the lights above them were actually technically still on, but I made this so bright that you couldn't even tell, so. It was supposed to be a Easter egg that Iris is here, but the fact that Axel creates Iris, I believe might be one, if not the only continuity error in the whole film. Okay. He landed on copy Axel 182 first try, and I don't have the original audio to show it to you. Um, but he was very excited about the fact that he got a first try. I love this scene. It was kind of chaotic to film during the school day, um, but it was a lot less stressful than some of the other scenes. Um, how did this all come to be? I had one of the judges from the student television network actually think that this was a real science fair. And they're like, great job on, or they're like, we don't know how you filmed the science fair scene. Maybe you just filmed it alongside an actual science fair. No. So these are all just random boards from different teachers. Majority of them are actually my past science fair thing. So this one right here is one that I did about like, UV light and plants and stuff like that. And then right here, it's actually KVHS production. So the production, our, our film production class is called KVHS. Um, oh, I, I don't have it on. Okay, anyways. Um, so that's the little board that they always make whenever whenever we're doing presentations, we'll whip out that board. And I was like, oh, let's put it in the science fair. Um, and yeah, over here is Nate just standing all by himself. Um, so how did we film this? I reserved this for our open period. Um, we call it Viber Connect, but I reserved it for our open period. And then um, 
the open period came and I went into, this is our side gym, so our small gym. Um, and I go in and PE is there. And I'm like, uh-oh, um, excuse me. Uh, we res we reserve this area, and he's like, I had oh I'm I didn't I didn't know that on that, but um PE has to be here for open period because we're doing certain stuff, um and I was like, oh so it turns out there was a conflict of schedules there, um because we had apparently both reserved the small gym, um so I whipped out a deal with the PE teacher, and it was you can have it for the first like twenty five minutes of free period and then I'll have it for the rest of free period and then I'll have it for the beginning of lunch. So with the small amount of time that we had to set up during free period, I set up all of the table, or we all set up all the tables and the um, presentation boards. And then when lunch came, I went around, I tried to get as many people to get up out of their lunch tables, walk into the uh, small gym and pretend to be extras for the science fair scene. Um, it was not as chaotic as some of the other scenes that we filmed, and it was a lot of fun. Here is Lucy Schwartz's baking soda volcano, which, in case you're wondering, is a not. Well, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, but that's my friend Kendall. Mrs. Long was one of the, our three judges. Um, that's Madeline, one of my other friends. And there's Nate. No, he's all by himself. How sad. Uh, with his drone. And they're just walking right past him. Where are they walking to, you might be wondering. Well, you've seen the film, so you probably know where they're walking to. Um, and it's like the simple things. Like, obviously, if I see a camera, because this whole scene was set up to be filmed. And if I see one of the only cameras rolling, I'm not gonna walk in front of it on purpose. Um, so I just asked these two people real quick to walk in front of it, and then he sort of follows them along with his eyes. And it's the nuanced stuff, you know what I mean? Um, his microphone's right there. We don't talk about that. There's Mr. Walker in the flesh, and Chris again. He actually made a board. Can't say the same for Trevor. Okay, with the trifolds, I went around to all the teachers asking them if I could borrow science, trifolds, whatever. And one of the teachers, it was a marketing teacher, so not even a science teacher, thought that I wanted an empty trifold. And I was like, well, I guess I can put it in the background, and if I don't do a close-up on it, then it might seem like there's stuff on it. Because think about it. If a student comes up to you and asks for a trifold, they're probably asking for a blank one. And I didn't I didn't think about that. Like, obviously, they're asking for a blank one, so that way they can use it to put stuff on it. And I was like, no, I want completed trifolds that have students' projects on it. Um, so I ended up with this blank trifold anyways. Um, and I'm trying to think whose idea, it was either me or Trevor who was like, what if we just had like a blank trifold for the student who didn't even do the science fair project? Um, so Trevor, our assistant camera operator, this is his cameo. It's kind of funny. Kind of funny. It was, it was really funny. <laughs> and then... Okay. A few things I have to say about this. Uh, you see Iris right there. Um, this kid right here. I have a theory. I can only see the back of his head, so I think I know him. Uh, it might be my friend Alec, but it might not be. I think it is Alec. Um, but it, I spent so many hours trying to rotoscope around him. Um, and because the laptop that I was using to edit it didn't have a lot of RAM, really technical stuff, um, but it didn't have the right computer qualifications for me to be running special effects like rotoscoping, which takes up a lot of power in, from a computer. Um, so it would only render out like one frame every few seconds and I couldn't watch in real time So I'm like I'm just gonna render it out in full time and hope that it's per that it's good and it's not perfect not at all um, Hello. Yeah, not it, if you're looking at it very closely, then it's not very good um, This is my only cameo in the whole film just because I'm constantly behind the camera um, but this was filmed on a tripod with Trevor, our assistant camera operator, filming this scene. And I was like, I'm gonna jump in because I just wanted a cameo for myself. 
Michael and Ryan have matching shirts and it was supposed to be like a plain colored shirt. Um, but this is the only one that we could find in the costume room, which is so funny because I love these ones way better than any normal um, solid colored one. There's my brother again. I love pointing him out. Um, and the eighth grade science fair project that I did, or the engineering project that I did with the Raspberry Pi, uh, this right here is the trifold for that. Hello, I'm Iris. It's so good to see you. So she glitches out there. Um, I see there's a fellow solar powered device over there. Hats off to you, tinfoil oven. Okay, so the the idea with I see there's a fellow the idea with Iris is there are certain elements from this film, if you can believe it or not, I took from Pinocchio. Essentially, it's like um, Nate creates a boy and the boy becomes a real boy, kind of like Pinocchio, you know. Um, and in almost sense, in almost sense, almost a sense, uh, I thought about this when writing. It's kind of a stretch now because I didn't really go back to it on the writing part. But when I was writing Iris's character, I tried to make her similar to Jiminy Cricket. And what does that mean? What, well, Jiminy Cricket is essentially the conscious conscience of Pinocchio. Um, so Iris is essentially supposed to be symbolizing the conscience of Axel. And again, I didn't go back and I didn't change that just because it's another plot point that did, did not need to be added into a 16 minute short film. Um, but if I had more time to develop this and, and if the runtime was longer, I definitely would have made more scenes with Iris where she's sort of instructing Axel on what to do. Um, the symbolism of that is essentially in this scene, she's taken out because at the beginning, she's inside of Axel's head. She's doing like the initiating, initializing test number one or whatever. Um, and now she's separated. So essentially Axel loses his consciousness so he, he no longer has morals he doesn't have a conscience or yeah, yeah, yeah he doesn't have a moral conscience anymore solar powered device it's small thing and again i didn't reflect back on it but that was the the idea around this it's over there hats off to you tinfoil oven you guys are Axel. i only had like two lines oh the lines for her was Hi, I'm Iris, dot, dot, dot. And then I finished the rest of the script, and then when I went back to do the voiceover with Gabby for all of her lines, like the initializing test at the beginning, and then all of these lines, I look at it, and I'm like, I just realized I didn't finish writing your lines. So we just came up with the tinfoil oven thing on the spot. Fellow solar-powered device over there. Because she's supposed to be a solar-powered robot, so haha, solar-powered. You know those solar-powered pizza oven things? Same idea. This is a 3D printer, by the way. Um, if you can believe it or not, the, she didn't actually have a face. I added in that. <laughs> Yeah, kind of crazy to imagine. Oh, to you, tinfoil oven. You guys are Axel, crazy actually, you stole my code. I don't know what you're talking about, Nate. You betrayed me and stole the Axel 182 coding. No, this is Iris. She's completely different. See, he's so snarky now. Like, he's completely different. Like, the way that he talks, his inflections, the way that he looks is, like, completely different than the beginning. Is there a problem here? We'll see. Welcome back, everybody, to the finals. Mr. Showman! Wait, that's... Yes! Yes, thank you so much for being in this. This was a huge hassle to film this scene. Definitely not one of the most stressful scenes for me. It was for Mr. Showman because it was his only scene. Eighth annual... He's the principal. Science Hank. fair at Ferrado High School. Let's give our contestants one final round of applause. His energy is like, he didn't deliver any of his lines correctly. And I told him that. I was like, afterwards, like this is months after. I was like, Mr. Showman, thank you so much for being in this film. After we showed it to everyone and he watched it, and he's like, it's a great film. And I was like, thank you so much for being in it. You did an incredible job. You didn't follow any of your lines, but he has such a vibe. Mr. Showman is such a vibe. Like the air pump, he is like the jock teacher that knows nothing about... It's like um the, the PE coach from... Have you ever seen Meet the Robinsons? There's a PE coach in there, and he's judging the science fair, and he knows nothing about science. And it gives me the same vibes. He's doing an air pump, and he's all hyped up, and he it, it, he just gives off the vibes of knowing nothing about science, and it's so funny. This was filmed at the end of the day. This scene right here is filmed at the end of the day. Um, so let me go forward. 
All right, finalists, your your presentations and research are outstanding. However, there can only be okay. one. Okay. This right, finalists, your your presentations. You can't even. I can hear it because I know what to listen for. But the final bell is going off right now. The our fight song is the final bell of the day, and I cover it up with, or it gets covered up with the music and with the talking. All right, finalists, your your and the clapping presentations and research are outstanding. However. But our, our final bell is playing there. Why didn't I include any other scenes? Because we tried reshooting. I, I, I Believe me, I tried reshooting that. Um, but the audio was not good on the reshoots. And uh, <laughs> ironically, the audio was best on the scene where the audio gets messed up. Um, and then he had to go deal with an incident immediately following this. And he's like, I got to go. I'm so sorry. There can only be one winner in this competition. So... These shots are filmed without Mr. Showman because he had to go deal with like a student, I believe. Ending, however, there can only be one. Um, so the only people who actually stayed with me throughout this whole scene was um, Ezra and Ryan because M Michael and Mr. Showman had to go do stuff, and I had Winter. to make it seem like everyone was together on stage. In this competition, the winner of the 8th annual Verado High School Science Fair is Excellent Tommy with their AI robot. It's so bad. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> it's so funny though. What? No, uh, he can't win. He stole my programming. Hey, don't be a sore loser, man. No, I can prove it. He stole my programming. Okay, this right here. Hear me out. When I was filming this, it was so awkward. It was so cringe. And when I wrote it it was so cringe and i have a screenshot from our message uh, from our text messages in the group about how much i hated this scene but it was on purpose i made it so bad on purpose because i was like if i can't make the audience cry or laugh i can at least make them feel extreme amounts of cringe let me show you mr showman's face real quick make it stop stop it's it. so no. it's so awkward Lefty. it's so horrible Sorry. look at how look at how uncomfortable mr showman looks in this moment it's so funny and i hate it so much i don't want to talk about this scene because it's your chance to hang out with the cool kids and you just abandoned me now you're getting a taste of how humiliating it was i never meant to make you feel that way i just finally got a chance to see what it was like to feel i haven't had anyone to be my friend since died nate i'm sorry i don't know what to say around here this is i haven't had anyone an amazon fire stick remote if you were wondering um be my friend since who am i giving a shout out to i think charlotte was able to get the lights i think it was charlotte who was able to get the lights working so shout out to charlotte for that died nate mr showman doesn't have any lines he's just standing there awkwardly and it's so great i love it i'm sorry i guess i just got so blinded by the newness of high school that i lost sight of our friendship no i'm i'm sorry I became so overbearing that I thought if I controlled you enough, you'd be forced to be my friend, but... Mr. Showman is just looking there. He's like, what's going on right now? Maybe we've all been so self-centered that... Okay, this monologue, no one else is on stage. Everyone else went off to do their own stuff. Think about others. And you may be wondering, what are you talking about? We cut back to the other people. Those other clips that we cut back to were clips that I cut or that I filmed before everyone had to leave, and then I cut back to make it seem like they were all still together on stage. Because that's how it's supposed... In the story, they're all on stage together, but in real life, everyone left. I mean it, but... Like, not in a bad way. Like, they had to go do stuff, but it's like I had to make it seem like it was all... Everyone was still there. You're just so focused on the next step on how you could get ahead. And once you look up, you realize that all your friends are a million miles away. You just spend time with the ones that was like one little thing i was like wouldn't it be funny if like ryan had like this whole recollection moment of him being just like a horrible person the entire film and then he's like you know what yeah man I really understand that and it's sort of like the simple-minded kid and he's like well, oh yeah man he's speaking he's speaking the truth <laughs> how many have left with them and life's too short to hate them let's just cherish every moment we can with them Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker wanted a cameo at this point. I was like, all right, yeah, yeah you can get it.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have a, an announcement. Our three finalists are disqualified from the competition. <laughs> the music just cuts out and it's so funny. That means that Lucy Schwartz and her baking soda volcano is your champion for the eighth annual Verado High School Science Fair. The joke there is from Phineas and Ferb, Doofenshmirtz always loses to a baking soda volcano. And in the show, he loses in like the science fair and then he loses in his innators contest, like the Doofenshmirtz innators that he makes. He loses to a baking soda volcano. So then he goes into poetry. Uh, he makes different like... Um, poems and stuff and then he 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 speaks out the poems and then he loses to a baking soda volcano in a, po a poetry competition was it called poetry slam or something like that um so that was sort of the joke is they lost to a baking soda volcano lucy wherever you are we're giving you an applause and then the scattered applause versus the applause originally where everyone was like super excited as right now it's just awkward and the second air pump i love it this is the last scene that we filmed, which is also the last scene of the movie, which is why it works out so tremendously because it literally was the last scene that we filmed, except for our pickup shot that we had of the Mountain Dew chugging scene. But everything else was filmed before this. So I think it was really, it wasn't initially like that. And then it just happened to be like that. And of course, throughout the whole film, he's still wearing the watch. Um, at the beginning, Nate talks about how he wants to go to the park and fly a drone around with his dad. Um, and Axel sort of symbolizes his dad in the fact that he is Nate's best, both of them are Nate's best friends. And Axel through the watch is fueled by the love that Nate and his dad have with each other. Um, so even though Nate's dad is dead, he still goes to the park and flies the drone around with his best friend. All the kids playing in the playground sound effects are also Al added in afterwards. I don't know what's up here, because I don't think there were any... There may have been kids playing at the playground, but I don't remember there being kids. Like, look at that little blob move. Like, that might be a kid playing at the playground. I don't know. This scene turned out, like, so beautiful on the camera. I don't know why. Uh, can I join you? It was, like, a cloudy day, and the, because it was surrounded by mountains, the sun went down, like, over here, so it was still very bright out, but there was no direct sunlight. He scoots over for him to join him. People are like, oh, he didn't have to scoot over. Nate Nate can just sit right next to him. It's an invitation, okay? It's a gesture. Obviously, he doesn't have to scoot over for Nate to sit down, but it's an inviting gesture, okay, everyone? I know you're trying to be smart, but... He, or he, could, just, he could just sit over here. He didn't have to scoot over. It's 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 an inviting gesture. He has the drone in his hand. His tie is a little bit untied. His top button is unbuttoned. Um, they're they're done with the day, essentially. It's sunset, and it's been a long day. You know, there's something I don't understand. The Iris Project. She kept glitching out, and I couldn't figure out why. I even used the same code you did. I looked at my original code, and there were tons of errors, and yet somehow, I'm still functioning. After so many attempts, I finally discovered that I just needed a conductor for the processing chip. And that watch you wear used to belong to my dad. And after I put it on... It just In all honesty, I don't like this all too much. I think just because it was the end of the script and I needed something to fill in. You might be wondering, why does the watch have to be a plot point? It's for this exact reason. Axel create... Axel is sentient. And fully, he's he's at this point in the movie or in this point in the film, he represents a human, like an actual person. Um, he's more related to any sort of human than what he, any what he may have looked like at the beginning. Like look, calibrating. Cal look at how dead his face is here, and then look at how just after so how many attempts, emotion I that I just it is in this scene. For the scene. Um, and that watch you wear used to belong to my dad, and. After I put it so it's the power of the watch that turns him into a human. It's not the coding. Because essentially, Axel creates a robot with the exact same code that was created to use him. So my question is, what is the implications of a robot create a sentient robot that creates another sentient robot by copying and pasting it? So Axel is supposed to be a one-time fluke, so he can't be recreated. Um, just to sort of close that 
idea because again think about the implications of a code that creates a sentient robot so we find out in the end it's not just the code it's the code matched with the magical watch um so axel can't be recreated because if that were the case then axel could just be killed and then he could just create another axel and then we could have a whole axel army and then we would have attack apocalypse of the robots essentially um so axel is supposed to be a one-time fluke they're on it's just all the code started to work i don't really understand it music music's so good i love the music Sets it down, he comes back, and then we do the switcheroo with the drone because this drone cannot so much time work. This drone cannot in fact fly, so we do the switcheroo. Thing on the drone that I really had a chance to fly it. You fly first. You deserve it. And then flies off into the sunset and all of the cast and crew had to move. There was equipment over here. I was like, I'm like, oh, dang, I'm going to get a super far out drone shot. You can still see the Christmas stuff in the background. Um, so we're actually by this tree on the other side of this tree right here. We had to move all of our equipment over for that final shot. I love this music so much. There are three main themes. Um, and then in addition to other uh, filler that he created with three main scene themes the original project 182 theme and then there's a nate theme and then there's just like a joking i don't know what the third theme is it's just like a joking theme so this is the main theme in this render there are three typos in the credits and then of course in a later render it's all fixed here, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the three typos are fixed in the newest render, but in this render, there are three typos in the credits. So if you watch the live YouTube video, I'm not replacing it because it already has a ton of views. Um, you're just gonna have three typos in the credits. You can look at the credits. I'm just going to talk about the music. The music is just... I love the music so much, and I, already, I keep saying that, but truly, the music is incredible. And here is the... Um, this is the joking theme. I don't, I don't have a name for it, but it's like... Um, at the, be the beginning montage where they're joking around, it's kind of funny. It's a funny theme. I don't know what to call it. And then this transitions into the saddest theme of the three of them, which is Nate's theme. Um, whenever there's reference to his father, a picture, or he talks about him, or he thinks about him, or when his character is supposed to be thinking about his father, um, the way that we represent that is through the theme, the Nate's theme, when he thinks about his father. craft services so for the long shoots i tried to have food for cast and crew thankfully to well i get to the um gofundme supporters later on but i really do appreciate everyone who donated so that way i could get food for the cast and crew because i had no other way of paying them and there were they we filmed some really long days Mr. Bauer was an absolute lifeline. He, I can't even express how incredible he is. And that's, that is why I put him first on um, the special credits or in the special thanks at the end. I put, I made sure to put him first because he is just so incredible. And so is Mr. Olivas. We ended up using Mr. Olivas's welding shop instead of Mr. Bauer's auto shop. So they're both super cool. I could go on and on about all these credits, but it's, gonna add like another three hours to the video so i'm just gonna let them play through and this uh, this is the sad nate theme right here right here's when it starts
in total, I just, it was a lot of fun. Um, everything about it was so much fun, and it's, it's an experience that I will always, oh, it's loud. This is an experience I will always remember. Um, just because of the support of everyone, it, it, it made this whole thing so much fun to record and film, and it was so much effort, um, but in the end, it was so much fun just to do everything, work with everyone. I know, I would say, I know nearly everyone, if not, I know every single person on this list, and I worked with every single person on this list um, just to get this film to where it was, and I'm so happy that this is like a thing that exists now. And it's because of all these incredible people and my my, my parents as well, um, my mom and my dad who, who really helped support me along the way. Um, and I don't know, this, this whole journey took so long. And now looking back on it, I'm so, it's a memory that will never go away. And I know it's a, nem a memory for a lot of the cast and the crew as well that will never go away. Um, so I'm just so grateful for all of the opportunities. The music is incredible. Um, it was, I don't even know what else to say. This is one of the greatest experiences in my life. 